we have to have an understanding of like what that hardness really is for ourselves. And when the things that are coming up are really a reflection of the things to work on within ourselves versus something toxic in the relationship. Stress is the inflammation that robs us of life, energy, and happiness. Our typical solutions for gut health and hormone balance have let a lot of us down. We're over-medicated and underserved. At The Less Stressed Life, we're a community of health-savvy women exploring solutions outside of our traditional Western medicine toolbox and training to raise the bar and change our stories. Each week, our hope is that you leave our sessions inspired to learn, grow, and share these stories to raise the bar in your life and home. Access to functional or specialized medicine testing and standard blood work is a big piece of personalizing care plans to help our clients succeed. But getting accounts with multiple labs and ordering and tracking results from many different web portals slows efficiency by bogging us down in admin work. This is why I'm completely obsessed with our podcast sponsor, Rupa Health. It's a single portal that allows you to order from over 20 specialty labs in one incredibly simple dashboard. I'm talking less than 30 seconds to set up your free account and about 30 seconds to order the labs you need. All the results are in one place and I can securely send clients their results with the click of a button. A big advantage for our clients is that standard blood work can be ordered for almost two thirds less than other direct to consumer lab sites. Rupa is a lab concierge, so they send the lab invoices on your behalf if a client pays for their own labs. They help them get set up with a lab draw, navigate testing questions, and they provide the requisition forms. It's literally a dream. Go sign up for free to help streamline your practice and simplify ordering labs for your clients at rupahealth.com. That's R-U-P-A health.com and let them know I sent you when you sign up. You can also check out the show notes for this episode for a short video walkthrough of how I use Rupa Health in my own practice. All right. Today on The Less Stressed Life, we have a lovely friend, Clara Art. Schwager. I just asked her how to say this and I feel like I butchered that terribly. Clara Art Schwager. She is such an interesting person. And I'm just going to read kind of the bio the way she, I mean, she could read it too, but I'm just going to share about it because I think it'll give you a little bit of an insight into Clara. She describes herself this way. I'm a dating and relationships coach and a writer. And I often say I'm the dating coach for folks that would never hire a dating or relationships coach, largely because I don't actually believe marriage or relationships are the all end all. Are we wired for connection? Absolutely. But do I feel that comes in a variety of forms? Indeed. I wanted a relationship to be sure, but I also wanted a way of seeking it that didn't fill me with anxiety and dread or the notion that I had to treat dating like a job. And once in a relationship, I wanted a partnership that didn't rob me of my own life. I found most dating and relationships rhetoric from five-step plans to get the guy on Instagram to how to love myself and now to fall flat. I'm not sure if I got that right, but I wanted a more nuanced conversation around love and partnership. Why did I want it, but also in a way fear it? What made it so uniquely hard for me? And so on and so forth. Women and yes, some men who jive with that conversation are the ones who thrive in my programs and work. I think... I don't think this is a fair statement exactly, but it's almost like Clara is a poet. I mean, she's definitely a writer, but I'm like, it's like, she's like, it's like, I know someone who's going to be in a history book. So Clara, you and I met in a group of entrepreneurs this year and wow. immediately she's got like this kind of magnetic, our friend Carrie calls her a seer, which is like what everyone knows a seer. It's like a person who just kind of like gets a sense about you and kind of can ask the right questions. It's like a therapist, but different. And I don't think that's a fair assessment either, like a poetic therapist. So I don't know. You'll get the vibe here in a moment. Welcome, Clara. I love that sentiment of poetic therapist. I mean, I'm always, you know, like (laughs) careful to throw around that term with it being a coach, but I feel like I was a seer my whole life. And it kind of got me into a little bit of trouble with like friendships where it was like, oh, like, do you want to go for the jugular and talk about like all the deep problems in your life? (laughs) (laughs) So now I've condensed that into a career. But yeah, I mean, I think poetry is very amorphous, nuanced, fluid. It can be so many things. And, And I guess both in the way I think about dating and I think about relationships, especially in this time that we live in. I think both through the work that I do and then the way that I am, I like to give like a wide berth of permission there around 
what that looks like, how we go about it, and just how we feel about it all. So I'll take that description. I think it's hard to understand how you become in this place sometimes. So Mm. will you give me just a little background about how did you end up in this area and be such an kind of like a wildflower Mm. in a sea of grass or something. (laughs) You're kind of like a, like an odd dating coach. And like that, I don't think that's a good description for you. A dating coach. It's like, and that's how you're describing it as well. It's like, it's not really like that. It's about relationships in general. And that is our topic is like relationships, Mm -hmm. like help us sink or swim. Like they affect, even though we're responsible for our own emotions, they affect so much about how we present in the world and how we feel Mm -hmm. at the end of the day. So I'm just curious how you kind of got into that. And like you yeah. said, you're like, I've always been a seer. And I'm just, I have a lot of questions about that too, but maybe another day. I'm not sure if we'll, we'll <laughs> I can give you, I can give you a little taste of it, All but right, I, good. I feel like there are two parallel paths. And I think that there, there's the whole, like your mess becomes your message. So I think in terms of, I knew from a very young age that romantic relationships were going to be a challenge for me. And part of that was because of my parents' divorce and them having multiple marriages on both sides. And and I don't mean that in a sort of dramatic sense, just that my dad was married multiple times. My mom was married multiple times (laughs) and neither really shook out that well. And then I wasn't really surrounded by healthy relationships, but I also say that too, with a grain of salt, because I'll meet a lot of people that think like, Oh, well, I am this way because my parents did or didn't divorce. And, And it's certainly not that linear, but I think we kind of come into the world and think we are supposed to know naturally how to have a healthy relationship. And I don't know, like manage our 401k. And I (laughs) I really think that we're not armed in that capacity. And that was kind of a gift for me from an early age to be like, I'm going to need help in this area. I'm going to need to work on this. And, And so I think of that sort of as like one path that just made it apparent to me that this was going to be an area that I wanted to focus on in my life but not in a work sense. The work thing came more from, I will say there were, you know, at a very young age, I think it was like seven or eight. And we had a typewriter. I'm 30, I'll be 37 in the fall, 36. So like that gives you a little window in the time. We had a typewriter and I used to pretend, I don't, I think if you would ask me like, are you being a life coach? I wouldn't have said yes, but I used to pretend I was like a manager or a boss. And I would write these like fake letters to my employees, giving them constructive feedback, but always with a level of like, we're all in this together. Like it was just, you know, I think there were little nods here and there as to how I presented in that way. But I also grew up in an environment that, and this is true for a lot of the women that I serve, where it was to my benefit to really be able to read the room, Mm -hmm. but obviously to my detriment, right? So it's like my ability to be a seer and pick up on things and see things in people part of it comes from that. And so it's something it's, you know, learning to channel that has been really helpful, but I think those are the sort of two parallel paths and really, you know, what that shook out to, I worked in marketing for the better part of a decade. I was the VP of marketing for a tech startup. And I was very much on a path of like this from the outside looking in looks very, very good. And the idea of being not just a life coach, but a dating and relationships coach was like, absolutely not. That sounds like really unprofessional, really, I don't even think it's sleazy. What does that consist of? Is it a matchmaker? I had so much stuff there that really blocked me from even considering it, that it actually had to happen kind of haphazardly, which essentially it was in my early thirties where I was working at this tech firm, the stress, the anxiety, I developed SIBO because of it, which was ultimately the thing that pushed me out of the nest. And then I was like, okay, fine. I'll go get trained as a coach, but I actually also got trained as a nutritional therapist. I did the year long nutritional therapy association program because I was like, I can't be just a life coach. A health coach sounds more like presentable, less, less embarrassing in some sense. I'm not a health coach. I've never, I did the whole thing, but, but I don't do that. And ultimately what happened was I was also writing at the time. And one of my previous jobs, I had worked for the publisher, Condé Nast. I worked for Self Magazine. And so I had contacts in the publishing industry and I was able to kind of get one of my personal essays to the front of the line for The Cut, which is a column in New York Magazine's online presence. And that went viral. This was in the fall 2018. 
that went viral. And it ultimately at that point, it was like, no one, you know, I had this meek little website up that had like health coaching, maybe a little dating coaching, but not really. It would be like, like this small sign in the back corner. And that essay was what really cracked things open and, and gave me the permission and started me on the path of seeing that my approach and my modalities were both different and very needed. So that is a little bit of a round that way of how I got to do this work. I mean, there was all sorts of, you know, training within all that, but I figured the other story is more interesting. <laughs> I love, I kind of am jealous of, I don't know if it's a podcast or a TV show or both, but the, how it works like behind the scenes. I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, it does mm-hmm. and I think people ask me like, how do you start? It's like, there's not really like a three-step process here. <laughs> You kind of, you sometimes, and I heard a couple, there was a few really like gorgeous messages, which actually come up every single time I talked to you. But one was, and this isn't necessarily your quote, but I wrote it very highlighted at the top. Your mess becomes your message, which is such a good statement. There was another thing. We call it being a seer, but also you had a unique ability to kind of sense or read the room. And my friend talks about this a lot with divorced parents and about how that has been a challenge in people pleasing in all these things as she's grown up. And we talk about it pretty frequently. And then I also heard, we didn't use this word, but as a recovering empath or a trying to recover empath. I think you and I, like that was a thing. I would take on people's emotions accidentally working with them, totally mm-hmm. unprepared and unrealizing. In some ways, it makes you an incredible practitioner because you can kind of, again, read the room, you know, look in a little bit deeper under the service, pick up on cues. It's a bizarre yeah. thing. I don't really know that you teach that. It's like, it's almost like super sleuthing detective work. I don't know if that's even the proper term, but being an empath is also can be really like draining because you're accidentally picking up on people's emotions. And it sounds like you have that natural tendency as well, or it's kind of just part of your makeup. Yeah, Yeah. totally. And the last thing, aside from like your story about getting the demise of health under stress, you know, (laughs) the all day conversation here. Um, (laughs) But you said something, I think that's really valuable. And it reminds me of an early part of my career, the essay cracks that you got permission. Something gave you permission. Mm-hmm. And don't we all seem to need that? Like I always say to my clients, like you don't need permission for me to do this, but we all seek permission or validation from some outside source. Isn't that fascinating? Right? Like I remember when I was just kind of getting started in my business and feeling a little bit like, oh, I think I got this right, but not this right. And I had a conversation with a coach and he's like, well, I think you could do this. And it was almost like, oh, I just needed permission. I just needed someone else's belief in me to spread my wings. And then it was like, I'm unstoppable. Like, it was like, that's what I needed for the confidence. Right. I, we need that all the time. And I, I feel like I do it all the time with clients. Not, I feel like I do, but it's something I use for myself of when I'm thinking about myself or my life or what I'm working on, where am I seeking permission? Like, where am I just looking for someone else to tell me it's okay to do this? And then I could just give myself that. But yeah, I mean, that's a big part of when I started dating as an adult, which was circa 2014, when I was in my late 20s at that point, I started dating in person. And that was really like, that was, this happened well before I ever kind of entertained being a coach. But people would then position me, and this was more anecdotally in friends, and I would be introduced to, I was living in Brooklyn at the time, interested at parties as, oh, Clara is an expert in dating. And I was like, I'm not an expert. <laughs> I mean, depending on what you consider an expert is, but I, I literally just had, you know, recognized that the act of meeting someone in person in the digital age, we had merely decided that it was not feasible or not possible by way of presence of these digital tools. Whereas like nothing had actually, you know, there was no law, no one had said anything. And just because it's like, just because people are all doing paleo or something like that doesn't mean, oh, well, we would all do it because that's the only thing available, right? Or whatever the diet or preference may be, right? So it's like, I think permission was a big piece there around what do and don't I have permission to do in the context of this pursuit of partnership. And if I think I have to do things in a certain way, where is that idea coming from? And that was everything from, you know, starting to chat up strangers to deciding that I never really wanted to kiss someone on a first date, no matter how much I liked them, that I didn't feel comfortable with that. And a variety of other things that I'd have to like think on because now I'm like, this was years ago, but yeah, permission to think is a huge piece. Mm. 
So I know we wanted to talk a little bit today about how relationships and the emotions that we attach to relationships are the thing that keep people just feeling stuck a little bit, right? Because our emotions Mm -hmm. kind of dictate the rest of our life and relationships with people. Like you said, do we need connection? Absolutely. And so I think you're, you know, this like unconventional dating coach would maybe be like one way to say it or unconventional relationship coach, right? And so talk to me about relationships and emotions and things that keep people stuck. If you want to give some examples or even, you know, for me, I see how all of these emotions also affect health. And I find that the, for me, that's my biggest struggle in practice. I'm like, I can tell you how to fix this, (laughs) but if your emotions are clouding all judgment and you react, you know, based on your emotions, instead of like stopping and sitting with something, that's your biggest nemesis first. And so I find that overall, I mean, relationships all day, like we think about them all day long, right? In some capacity. Mm -hmm. So what occupies our brain? And I feel like you could say dating coach and generally it is more standard dating maybe that you're talking about. I don't know. But how often is, oh, I think I know the answer to this question. I can't wait to hear how you're going to describe it. But (laughs) how often is our relationship with our partner just a mere image of our relationship with someone else in our life, a parent or a family member or something like that. Does that make sense? Like, I mean, yeah, all the time, <laughs> yeah. all the time. I mean, I feel like when we start, things are both simple and complex. And I think that I'm going to answer your question, but it relates to something I've been thinking about in the last few days that's come up for me. And we could say this around whether we're talking about someone's physical health, like their gut or their emotional health is this idea of being healed. Mm. And this sort of how we can reach for it, just keep yearning to me. Like, I have to get that healed. I have to get that healed. And I had an interaction with my partner yesterday morning. He's actually the one that edits my podcast. And I had done something in the recording where I had actually, I don't know, I was in the wrong area in the recording and something else got recorded over and he was frustrated. And I'm someone who historically suffers from codependency by way of the environment that I grew up in. So I've had to work to not be work so hard to make other prioritize other people's emotions over my own and then also work hard to make them okay at my own expense. But it's an ongoing process, right? So you could say like, I haven't fully healed that yet, but I don't know if I will ever fully heal that. And it's a matter of me managing that on a day-to-day process or on a day-to-day basis. So I mess things up, you know, he's like, oh, it's so frustrating. You know, you can't, you know, can't do this. And he's later on, he was like, you don't have to apologize profusely, but I also have permission to be disappointed. And I was like, oh, you're so right. But essentially what happened was, is that he was tinkering with the episode. And then I went into our bedroom and I was making up that bed. And then I was cleaning up something in the guest room. And he came in and he said, did you just make all the beds? Even though I said I was going to do that because you felt bad. And I was like, yeah. And he was like, (laughs) and so the reason I bring up that example and this concept of healing, and then to your original question around managing these emotions is that to me, whether we're talking about a romantic partner, a parent, a sibling, a child, a professional relationship, that whole dynamic, that ability to witness that behavior in myself, witness my partner and say, oh yeah, okay, the next time I really want to give them more space to feel X, Y, Z. Oh, I see this in myself, like constant thing. I'm going to keep working on this and then not have that whole experience derail me so deeply and simultaneously also be able to have an acute understanding of it. Like I think because I work with women day in and day out who suffer from codependency, all of my clients do, right? So there could be a way in which someone's like, oh, you have to be completely healed from that in order to then serve in that capacity. But I I think back to this element of emotional management, I see it as really this way in which we're able to hold ourselves and witness ourselves both as individuals and in the context of others and be more fluid as we move through that. Does that make sense? It does. And I, for me, I see if you have experienced something that your clients are experiencing, you have a much more intimate ability to sense and understand and pick up on something faster than someone. Like I don't love working on issues. I've, my health is... I've had all the roller coasters, I feel like, Mm -hmm. but there's a few that I haven't had. And I try to step back from those because if I haven't, I mean, I've not had Lyme disease to my knowledge. I would, 
I would rather not work on that, right? Like I cannot understand yeah. intimately. <laughs> You're like, I'd rather not get Lyme. <laughs> I'd rather not be in that, you know, but for a long time, I stayed away from hormone replacement therapy discussions because I was like, well, I haven't gone through that phase of life, right? But I more intimately understand these other issues that women have gone through, gut issues, skin issues. I mean, that's a big one, right? Because you do a lot of stuff with skin. And so if you intimately know that you change your wardrobe around covering up what's going on with your skin, it's like not on a simple list somewhere. It's just like a different kind of understanding, if that makes sense. And I think that's what I hear from you is like, because you are still working on something, it's almost easier for you to help someone else with it, to see it. I yeah. And I think too, it's like kind of back to your, your point around like dating coach doesn't feel like an accurate title. Really. It's the management of self. It's the knowing mm. and management and self and regulation of ourselves. And you know, originally I did used to just work with women who were single and seeking partnership. And now it's a full spectrum, everything from women that are in that position or they're in relationship or they're 10 years deep into a marriage and determining, do I stay or do I go? And what's really been interesting about all of that work is I find that the same themes come to the surface. Mm, and please tell me. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> I mean, even the same thing. I feel like the same thing. I knew that I love common denominators and you're describing those, yeah. like you're going there. Yeah. What are yeah. some of the I common mean, denominators that you see popping up all the time where it's like, man, I feel like I just had this conversation. Am I having deja vu because did I have this conversation earlier today or yesterday? Happens to me frequently. But anyway, sorry to interrupt you. No. Well, I think in relationship, right? The whole thing is often it's like people will, you know, think, like I think the concept of a soulmate or jumping from partner to partner, and obviously there are partners that are not right for us, but this idea of the soulmate, that there's going to be this one person and things are going to lock into place. I mean, our relationships are our mirror, whether they're romantic or platonic or professional, wherever they sit, right? So like, even in this, how we met in this mastermind group, like we are a mirror to one another and that's the whole point of it. And so relationships will naturally bring up, especially romantically, because of sort of how intimacy in the brain and subconscious and how, you know, attachment styles get wired and love gets wired from a young age, we naturally attract the people that model, both model those early relationships. And that's where you really want to, you know, it's the clarity of self around the healing there as to, are we attracting healthy love? Or are we attracting love that resides more in a, an unhealed wound from childhood, which is a, a whole bigger discussion? But the hardships that come up like you want to have an understanding of those in relation to, is this actually bringing up something inside of me that is meant to be worked on and healed, mm -hmm. right? So it's like my partner's frustration and his expression of emotion is largely because he grew up in an environment where it was safe to express those emotions. And I did not. So my wanting to repress his feelings and apologize and all these things really actually comes from, it's not, you know, if I were to say, well, he's just an angry person and he expresses it's like, no, actually like what it is reflecting back to me is my ability and my capacity to hold more expression and rewire certain experiences that are part of the human experience that I learned were best tamped down. So it's like in the moment, I want to say, ah, but like <laughs> mm -hmm. 24 hours later, I can be like, oh, that's what was happening. That's what was happening. So I, I don't, I think we were talking about mirrors or reflections, but um, something along those lines. Yeah. Well, you said, you know, really relationships are management of self more yeah. than anything else. It's funny how, and then we started talking about common denominators, but on that same oh, yeah. note, the same messages, it's funny. I'm on this email list of someone and this was the message I got. And like, I never opened these emails, but I opened this one and maybe it was because the subject line was marriage is like about perfecting you. And I was kind of feeling that. So, and here's, I'll just read you a line from it. And then there's a follow-up piece to it. Society tells us that marriage is about finding that perfect person. Actually, it's about perfecting you. Um, mm -hmm. And that often takes people years into marriage to figure out. So it's about perfecting you. And so what was funny is I have a very wise teenager. You guys could get along very well. We were driving the other day and she said, I saw this great Instagram post from XYZ guy. And I get that that's the emails I'm getting from. And she's like, I don't even, I'm never thinking about marriage, but I just really liked that. It said, you know, that relationships are really about, it's not about the other person. It's about perfecting you. And I was like, oh my gosh, I got the same email from the same person. We follow the same person. It was like a few days apart, but I just think 
like, thank you for like all that collision happening in the same place. And now you're kind of bringing up the same thing. It's like, I am responsible for my own experience. And this came up with my coach this year too. I was saying nice things about my husband. She said, I think she's like, this is the second time you brought that up. And I said, well, I think he is hearing or like respecting X, Y, Z boundary. But I think I told him it's a while ago. So I'm like, I told him about something. I feel like he's responding better to blah, blah, blah. And she's like, that's really cute that you're giving him credit for that. Cause really the only thing that changed was you. (laughs) So, um, uh, but she's yeah. like, it's really cool. And something I want to make sure I underline for everyone else is that rewiring our experiences, I wrote mm-hmm. down rewiring experiences, part of the human experience, but just rewiring something. How do you change something you don't really realize is a problem? And that's where I struggle making all of this tangible, the way to talk about it. And, mm. you know, as I try to describe it to clients, as I try to describe, you know, what you, I think as as people hear this, they can kind of pick up on some of the tones of like, oh, I have to kind of dig into this past and pull these things out sometimes to understand how I'm presenting in this relationship or or whatever. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, and I do want to say, there was something I want to say in relation to something. Oh, it was around, I'll, I'll talk about the rewiring, but I did want to say in relation to the, you know, marriage is about perfecting yourself. But I think one of the things like there's very common rhetoric around like, marriage is work and it's hard or long-term relationships require work, but we have to really figure out for ourselves. Cause I spent the better part of seven years in the first part of my twenties in a relationship that was hard, but I would like the hardest makes it right. I think we have to have an understanding of like what that hardness really is for ourselves. And when the things that are coming up are really a reflection of the things to work on within ourselves versus something toxic in the relationship. And I, I think that's that we don't have the best it requires close looking and work to understand what does that actually mean for us. So I just wanted to clarify that because I think there's a lot of sort of like coffee table jargon or sort of bu- bumper sticker esque memes mm-hmm. <laughs> that are like marriage is hard and people are like, oh, okay. But then they don't know what to do with that. So mm. I was going to answer your, oh, it was around the rewiring. So I think, and this may be, you know, this is if people have been done sort of any work, whether it be therapeutically or coaching wise, like we're all, you know, you can be pretty familiar in the sense of essentially our subconscious that forms between, and these are the patterns and beliefs that form in our brain, primarily lock in between the ages of zero and eight, 14, if we're being generous. And there's a lot, and I'm simplifying here for the sake of time, but there's a lot there in terms of learned behavior around safety, love, connection, abandonment, intimacy, that it's, think of it like you learn a certain language or there's like a certain blueprint inside of you and you're kind of submerged into it. You don't necessarily have, have a choice, you know, children, it's very monkey see monkey do. And so you have that wiring and often that wiring produces certain behavior. So, you know, I'll have women say like, I just really like to be a planner. Like I love to be helpful. I love to be the one that like takes charge and leads. but there's liking to do something often is more like comfort. We find familiarity in something. And that familiarity may not have been born from a healthy place. So we see this a lot with control issues. We see this a lot with a whole host of other things in that regard. And so I find when it, if you think about wiring, and I'm sure your audience knows this, it's like literal neural pathways in the brain of why we exhibit certain patterns in our behavior. And so I think of the rewiring process as getting really, because people come to me and they're like, I can't meet someone or none of my relationships work out or I hate the apps, or I don't know if I should stay or leave, stay in my marriage or leave my marriage. Or I always feel this when I meet people or men are always like this to me or whatever. And this is the same true of physical right, health, a certain symptom, a certain experience surfaces, but it's really looking at what is driving that outcome or circumstance because it's never by chance. And I find most dating rhetoric that's like, you know, use this app or switch this in your profile or send this text message. And not all of it is this way. I'm simplifying, but it sits on the surface. It doesn't really get to what's beneath. And I often think of, I'll use this analogy or metaphor with clients where you may be familiar with this book, Krista, but there was a book that came out a couple of years ago that was called like the secret language of trees and essentially talked about the root network underneath the ground next within trees that made it so that like water moved in certain ways, that the trees didn't overcrowd one another, that they moved in certain ways in order to get sunlight, nutrients, all those types of things, right? So there's so much happening beneath the ground that we cannot see. And I often draw that analogy with why 
love, relationships, dating, what have you, sex feels a certain way for us and what we need to understand to get to the root. <sighs> There's a lot to get unpacked here, right? Um, <laughs> I know. I'm like, I think we need a part two. <laughs> yeah, we could. You know, I was talking to my friend who listens to this podcast and she said, if you could just always, and I, I'm like, I feel like I try to do this, but if you can always, what if, what would you say to the woman or the person listening to this and feeling like they're having some aha moment? Where would you mm. direct them like to start unpacking what's below the surface, perhaps? I mean, really, it's like, oh, how would you direct them to start changing if they feel like they want to change? Doesn't everyone want to improve or change some relationship? How would you yeah. tell people, like, here's how you kind of start to tap in to things on their own? Yeah. I mean, we were talking about this before we started recording, but a huge portion of the work that I do with clients is housed in writing. And so I would, this is actually what I used to do and in a form of my own self-healing work when I haven't done as much in the past, but I would listen to podcasts and I would listen to people that I admired, whether it be their content or what they were saying. And I would pause it and I would jot down a line or something from what they said, or a moment where something came up for me. And I would probably get like three to five bullet points within that. And then I would go back through each of those and I would free write on each of them. I would expand on each of them. And if you need more sort of like a, a um, container for this, questions as simple as, What's coming up for me right now? What's resonating in what I'm hearing? What does this make me think about in the context of my own relationships? And just start there. You know, those are like oftentimes the questions and the answers will kind of, the reason I can drop those in and sort of give them generally is they generally trigger something more specific in each individual. So if you take the time to actually consider those and look at those and take pen to paper on them, information will um, manifest, manifest itself for you. You're just giving it the space to breathe. Mm. So that's where I would start. That's where I, would, where I would start. And I would treat it with tremendous care and curiosity. I always say, let's get curious to what's there because we can kind of fear what's lingering underneath the surface. You know, a big one is people have a tremendous amount of resistance to dating. That's the big thing that I work through. They're like, I just can't motivate myself to do it. And they tend to jump to, I know, I just need to do it. It's sort of like, you know, doing a hard workout. Like I just need to push myself. And it's like, no, you actually need to pause and understand what that resistance is about. So I think there's often just not enough space given. Mm. That's what I would say. Oh, yeah. I feel that to my core. It's like, oh, well, that explains so much because often people don't have the space to breathe or the space to stop yeah. and think. I hear a lot of toxic statements from people like, I hope I have time for whatever, or you caught me in a busy season every single time I talk to someone or, you know, just like <laughs> all the things. And it's like, well, you only, you can change that. Right. Whether you think you yeah. can or not. That's what I often want to say to people when they either are like, it's not really twofold, either they're having problems in their relationship that they don't want to deal with, or it's not a good time to date. And I'm never going to be the one to be like, no, you have to do this right now. But it's that framing tells me something. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And yeah. it can be hard to make tangible for me, at least sometimes, but Clara, where can people <laughs> find you online? Yeah. My website is, I think I like you dot co dot co. And it's the same on Instagram at I think I like you dot co. I also have a podcast called I think I like you. And the content really spans the gamut. It's, it's for sort of any stage in the relationship, which is both the podcast, Instagram. And then on my website, I have a bunch of different essays and stuff like that. There's no shortage of content there. And yeah, everything's housed there. I have like different programs. I have a retreat coming up this fall. It should be pretty self-explanatory from there. Beautiful. Well, I look forward to having you back to talk about this again. Thanks, lady. Sharing and reviewing this podcast is the best way to help us succeed with our mission to help integrate the best of East and West and empower you to raise the bar on your health story. Just go to reviewthispodcast.com forward slash less stressed life. That's review this podcast.com forward slash less stressed life. And you'll be taken directly to a page where you can insert your review and hit post.